Welcome, welcome. Are y'all excited? Yes. Whoa. That's, that's almost too loud, but not really. <coughs> welcome, welcome. I'm Joan Hunter. For those of you, we have a lot of new people here tonight, and we welcome you. I just wanted to kick it off tonight, and then I'll be back in a few minutes, but we are excited. We're going to enter into worship and, and, just, and just have a blast tonight. <laughs> Hallelujah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're good until 10 o'clock in the morning, so praise God, okay? And uh, God bless you. Welcome the Bullocks. Woohoo!
let your breath come to us Lord the breath of God breathe on
in the middle of the night with his destiny knocking on my door never turn it away and never go back to sleep until you answer that door and say lord here am i what do you have for me that you would have me do in these times Fulfill destiny to me for for days about tonight and he said I want you to come out and the first thing you do he wanted me to sound the shofar he said I want I want the people to be able to catch a glimpse of their destiny that's out beyond them yet and there's a sound of destiny and a frequency of destiny that we're playing in right now. And I kept hearing this sound in my ears for days. So I came up here earlier and we played a few of those chords. So everything you're hearing, every word you're hearing is not rehearsed. It's a glimpse of something that we, we rarely get into. And it's destiny. Destiny. What is destiny? Destiny. When you were conceived, there was a spark of electricity that happened that started that life. A spark of lightning, a spark of electricity, a flash of light. That was God visiting your baby shower. And he came to you and he brought gifts. He brought gifts to that shower. And those gifts show up in most people when they're just children because their hearts are so tender before God. And it'll, they'll, it'll flash out of them at times. But as they move toward the darkness, as they get older, then those gifts become obscure and they finally forget they were ever there. But when Jesus the Christ comes into your life, the light of the world himself, he is that light. And the scripture said in St. John 1 that that light shined into the darkness and the darkness comprehended it not, or that means it couldn't hold it down and seize on it. And so when he comes into your life to, to be the Lord and Savior of your life, the darkness that's hidden those gifts within you can't hold them down any longer. And the Lord has a frequency of sound it's always a sound God said and it was he said and it was there's always a sound Elijah heard the sound of the abundance of rain there's always a sound preceding the event yeah. and tonight the Lord said play the sound of destiny the name of this guitar is even destiny 
He said, play the sound of destiny tonight and let the people reach out into it because tonight is the first night of the, your greatness. Yeah. Tonight is the first night of your greatness. Remember the Lord told Abraham, he said, I'll make you great. I'll make your name famous. Tonight is the night, the first night of your greatness. You're taking a step into your destiny. Destiny is something that nothing can hold down. Destiny has nothing to do with what your past was. Destiny has nothing to do with what somebody tried to tell you you could never be. Destiny is what God saw you to be, is what he brought to you at your conception, and he still sees you fulfilling that destiny. It makes no difference how old you are. It makes no difference how young you are. Destiny awaits. Destiny awaits. Destiny awaits. It awaits.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you excited? They're not done. <laughs> We've only just begun. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've never seen so many wires up here in all my life. Hallelujah. You may be seated for a few moments. And if we can turn the house lights up, I want to see how many of you are here. And I know there's some people I can't see because you're back there. And uh, we have, I think, three or four rooms that are set up for overflow, which is awesome. So... <clears throat> With all of you here, I want a, a prayer of agreement that we can start building our building that we've got designed, we've got architectural work, we got all that kind of stuff, and, and we can really pack the place out at about 3,000 people. How fun is that? Because we have so outgrown this place, so praise yeah. God. I uh, want to make sure, okay, great, I'll borrow that for a few moments, uh, that when you came in tonight, thank you, Jake, uh, that you got one of these. And if you didn't, raise your hand. So I'll make sure everybody got one. We've got great greeters out there that are doing a great job. I just want to briefly go through this. Um, and they're doing a great job. Look at that. Awesome, awesome. And it uh, just gives you a little bit of information about me, what we're doing here, vision statement. You get a cute picture of me, all that kind of good stuff. My CDs, my books. I've got 27 out. Uh, told I would never read or write. <laughs> Talk about messing with my destiny. We put the devil in his place. And uh, amen. And uh, one of the things that's really awesome is, you know, being told that. And, you know, and what Robin was talking tonight about destiny. And I've been praying the assignment of death off of your destiny be broken off. Yeah. Which is like a spirit of procrastination yeah. on steroids. Because the enemy knows our destiny more than we know our destiny. And he's scared of you. Amen. It wasn't quite a loud amen on that one, but let's say, okay, good. <clears throat> and then over here, we have um, some fun t-shirts say miracles happen. We have some amazing blankets. And I got a couple people that are going to hold up the blankets. And uh, they're kind of working away all the little things. Uh, that, this is some of the colors that we have. We've got another sheet that has the colors on it. They're prayed over. They're anointed. Um, Doug has a, cousin, a niece that um, was just gotten into a coma the last couple of days, uh, last couple of weeks, I think. And then we sent her air overnight, her a blanket, a pink one like that. And they don't understand, but as soon as the blanket went on her, her feet started moving, her hands started moving. Yes. Hallelujah. And a lot of you know who LaDonna Taylor is. And LaDonna normally plays the violin. And uh, she is being grandma and mother and mother-in-law and all that kind of stuff right now. Uh, two weeks ago, be three weeks tomorrow, her daughter-in-law had a massive stroke, brain dead. I'm like, no, no, no. So I took one of those blankets, wrapped it up. I've already prayed on each one of them and took it to the hospital. And all of a sudden, beep, beep, brain action. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> She's in rehab now. I walk in the other day. She goes, hey, Dad, this is Joan Hunter, which means her mind is sharp. She says, did you get your order? Don't forget to get David to get that delivered. And I'm like, yeah, she's running the business, even from the bed. And uh, today she was up walking and not like walking like us yet, but she's up and walking and holding her head up. And it's just absolutely amazing what God is doing. We've had so many people heal of cancer and all kinds of neat stuff like that. And uh, we've got those available. They're three for 100. And people are buying them. They're taking them to MD Anderson. Uh, I mean, it's just absolutely phenomenal what's happening. And they're buying them for all their friends and relatives. They did. <laughs> they're like, I was just telling them a couple of, a couple of testimonies. So many knee replacements, you know, surgeries canceled. Uh, I mean, just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, also, want to point out, put this on your fridge. This is upcoming events here, okay? We've got lots of exciting things. We've got a prophetic conference coming next month with lots of people. 
uh, Steve Swanson is going to be doing our worship for our Christmas time. And, uh, and then we're going to have all kinds of special things going on there. New Year's conference. And we are a happening place around here. Okay. And a lot of you love it. And, um, and then there's just lots more goodies on here. I, I want to make sure I got there. There we go. And uh, then there's some of the different kinds of blankets. But here we also, this is a healing center. I've been in the healing ministry for 53 years, uh, which is amazing because I'm not that old, am I? No. I'm older than your wife, though, so this is good. And, uh, but, but anyway, no, I turned 70 in June. I still can't believe it. I know. It's like, woo. And he's got me going all over the world. I, got, I just got booked in Iceland and Moscow the last couple of weeks and, and Africa and Africa and Africa and Africa and Africa. So praise God, literally going all over the world. And um, we're going, actually, we're going to Bermuda next week, <laughs> suffering for the Lord. We're doing a healing school, <laughs> healing school over there and all the lobster you can eat. Hallelujah. Fresh right out of the ocean. Yes, God is good. But if you have any questions about ordination, uh, healing school training, equipping, uh, you, we have a table back there that you can meet some people afterwards and talk to them. Uh, also, want to highlight, very, very important, if this is a healing center, and how many of you in here have been ordained through this ministry? Look at all those people. Isn't that good? They're trained, equipped, miracles happen wherever they go. Amen. We have one guy and he goes to the store every day and I don't know if it's Walmart or whatever, wherever he goes and he doesn't leave until somebody is healed and or saved. And he's here tonight and he was telling me and then he was going door to door. So he's going door to door. So he knocked on the door and, and this lady was, he was, he opened the door and, the, and she was listening to Christian television. So they just had, whoa, shouting hallelujah time. She was sick. God, I want to be healed. Send somebody to pray for me. Ding dong. And there he is. Hallelujah. And uh, she got healed. So that was so cool. And, uh, but we offer healing here uh, at every service. Prayer for healing, prophetic, things like that. There's a piece of paper that looks like this. It's in your brochure. It's also in the seat in front of you. Take a moment, fill it out, and then turn it over on the back here. And, and then bullet point list of things that you want to be healed of. Right shoulder, left knee. They'll pray for you at the end of service. No matter how late we go, they're going to be up here. And we pray they're available before the service, after the service, etc. I'm going to give a few goodies things away. Like I like to give. Uh, if you'll put the blessed um, thing up for me, please. Uh, this is, and Anna's going to come help me. And... Um, this is Promises of Abundance, and it's a CD that I recorded, and it's me reading scriptures on abundance. Love, joy, peace, happiness, definitely finances. So you can hit that and, and do the barcode there, or you can text BLESSED to 281-377-9725. Now, this includes all of you that are watching online. We have several hundred that couldn't fit in here, but they're from all over the world and they're watching, that applies to you also. And you can get this free CD, download it into your phone, your iPad, wherever. Because a lot of times, well, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the word of God. If you need to have breakthrough in your finances, plug this in and get it going into your ear. Play it throughout the house. It's great. This one's going to be free. I'm going to give it to Anna, whoever says, Anna, the loudest and the fastest gets it free. <laughs> Hurry back. This is revelation of restoration. And this is a time when God is restoring. She has been praying for supernatural breakthrough in her family. And uh, she's seated. We do scriptural giving here, 4530, which is um, going to give you hidden treasures, riches stored in secret places. Long story short, she's been looking for her dad for many, many years. She found her dad, unfortunately, in the obituary section. He had just died. But now she found out that he had 28 children. Woo! Her family really expanded. <laughs> Rich is stored in, and they're Christian. Most of them live here. So God is wanting to restore what the enemy has stolen. Okay. 
This one is Don't Give Up. I've got a book, Just Don't Quit. Don't Give Up is in the Bible 37 times. Here we go. It's so great having people yell your name when they're not mad at you. It's just really great. And I really felt led to give this one out, uh, especially felt led to do this one. This is called Healing Broken Heart Syndrome. I was diagnosed with broken heart syndrome and breast cancer in 23 years ago. And they told me I would never, ever get over it. I was given two years to live and I would never get over the emotional trauma that I went through. I'm so over it. I, wrote, I got supernaturally healed of breast cancer. I got supernaturally healed of broken heart syndrome. I don't have it anymore. I have an amazing heart at 70 years old and, and I've got books so you can get over it and, it, and not, and you say, well, then they said I can't get over it. <laughs> I proved them wrong. Jesus proved them wrong. <laughs> Healing broken heart syndrome. <laughs> She's got to get her exercise in. She's going to come back in just a minute. Okay. <laughs> Anna. <laughs> okay, do it in love. Okay, so this is something that we just came out with, and it's, they're so cute. Aren't they cute? And the guys are going, yeah. Anyway, but they are really cute. They come in a variety of colors, uh, anything from red, green, purple. But the important thing about this is, uh, this is called lip balm. Do you know anybody that's giving you some lip Seriously, I have prayed over every one of these bombs for God to anoint them and clean their mouth up. Amen. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. <laughs> Hang on. They're so crazy excited. It's awesome. Okay. A couple minutes and you can yell. Okay. But anyway... These are great Christmas gifts, especially to your boss. We had one that was a, worked at a, at a church and the head of this denominational church was treating her really bad because she was spirit filled. And, uh, and so she bought her one in New York. So it's like, okay. So somebody had one of these the other day, opened it up and they went like this and went like that. And the person was healed. So it's anointing balm, lip balm, clean your mouth up, some of you need it yourself, and uh, it's vanilla aloe vera, and they're very, very anointed, and you go, Anna, Anna, but she's going to give two of these away. Oh my God, that is awesome. Yes. We're going to have to pray for some people's throats after that. Hallelujah. And Robin goes, that's the balm of Gilead. Yes, it is. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, one, basically, one more announcement, um, and that is we've got service in the morning at 10, tomorrow night at 6, Sunday we have a prophetic class at 4, and then service at 6. And we are so incredibly excited to have Kat back in the house, back here in Tomball. Amen. And if you would like to receive an email from Joan Hunter Ministries, letting you know when we're having services, whether here, streaming, etc., cetera, uh, then you can, you can do that little barcode and then uh, text it to, or you can text, once again, 281-377-9725. Okay? I'm done for now. And back to all that's happening behind me. Amen? Yeah. Could you bring me the, my Bible and glasses, please? I was, um, I was so excited when I was asked to receive the offering tonight because it is a part of service and a part of worship. And it's just as important. People, you know, uh, Krista always says it's the most uh, solemn time in the part of ministry. But, and it's the part that uh, nobody really wants to do. But, you know, I get excited about the offering because I discovered 
about sowing and reaping back in 88 when I didn't have anything to sow and didn't know how to expect to reap. But I found out in God's word that there is a, a sowing part that we do for our finances. We don't buy things from God. Because everything he has is free. But what you do is you put something into action. You know, if you expect, now I, I'm, I'm straight up country girl, southern girl. I mean, family, Georgia, Alabama, uh, Mississippi. You know, I said sweet tea flows through my veins. And so my mom, she made a garden. We say made a garden. Every, you know, I, I found out in Louisiana, when you're going to eat, you're going to make some groceries. Yeah. And we're always fixing to do something. <laughs> and so she would go out, and she knew exactly what she was going to plant because of that little packet that she would go to the hardware store and get. Whether it was cucumbers or the plants or tomato plants or what, whatever she was getting, you looked at that packet on there of those seeds and you wasn't going to look at that and say, okay, I'm going to plant this and this says squash, but I think I'm going to get okra. Yeah. We say okra where I come from. Some fried okra, there's nothing better. I'm going to tell you something. This lady over here, she can throw down on some cooking. Yeah, that's right. Joan Hunter. I'm telling you what. She fed us well. I, I looked at everybody on uh, the team, and I said, man, this got love's truck stop beat, don't it? Okay, y'all can laugh. Yeah. See, I'm getting you in a joyful mood. So you're getting ready to sow a seed. Now, I, I'm just going to take just, just this brief little time because I don't believe in bucket plunking. I'll, I want you to know why you're sowing. You're living in a time when people are absolutely losing it. They're denying the fact of everything. They're replacing everything with something because it might hurt somebody's feelings or it might, it might uh, you know, well, we, let's just tone this down a bit. But if the word says it, then that should settle it. And... So many times through the past, we've heard about the wealth transfer, the wealth transfer, the wealth transfer. Well, I'm going to tell you, I believe in the wealth transfer. I believe that it's, that it's, it's coming, and I believe all this hell that you have saw come upon the earth has come to stop that because if he can stop a transfer of wealth coming to the body of Christ, then he can stop the, this revival that is trying to break. I see it like a, a, a dam that is that has these planks in it, and this water is pouring and it's rushing toward there and it's only going to take a few of the body of Christ to take yeah. these planks out for it to gush on through and get to the whole body. And in, but we, we let things slip. We take it for granted that, you know, we've sowed and, you know, I didn't get a harvest, so I'm going to let that go on by. No, when the thief is caught, you make him pay sevenfold his house. How many has got some things that they need back from the enemy? that he's stolen from because everything news flash everything the devil's got he stole because he's a thief right. well in james 5 it says that there is two cries in the harvest it says that it's been kept back by fraud wages how many has had wages that has been kept back by fraud oh, you're everybody you Exactly, you are in the time of fraud. Can I get an amen? amen? And so in this time that you're in, 
you know, I was I was reading this, and and I'm not, you know, I'm not promoting anybody's song right or anything, especially this one. But I mean, the truth's the truth. And so I I was uh, I know James is in my Bible. Hold on, <laughs> he hadn't skipped out on me, and. Uh, here we go. So it says in James, James 5 says, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupt and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered and the rust of them shall be a witness against you and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. Behold the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is, ke is kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Seboeth. Now this phenomenal song came on. I mean, it just took the internet by storm. And I was reading James 5, and it says, Go uh, go to now, you rich men, and it popped in my head. I said, I looked at Robin. I said, Go to you now, you rich men, north of Richmond. <laughs> and I said, and some of you, you're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. I said, these two cries, and those cries mean declare. Yeah. It means to declare. So you've got a harvest in a field somewhere crying for you that's been kept back by fraud but the second cry is your declaration to cry for that harvest to come to you and so i'm telling you tonight some of you you've got to stand up you've got to get that second wind about you and you've got to get mad enough at the enemy to sit down and say okay i'm going to tell you you have stolen from me for the last time i took a pen and paper and i began to write down everything for years and years and i'm going to tell you when i got through i didn't even cheat the devil i multiplied instead of made it a fold and it was really more than what he's supposed to be giving back. But I'm going to tell you, I got real serious about that. Yeah. And I, t I told him, I said, you're going to pay back every red penny that you've ever taken from the Bullock family. And I am going to remind you every time. We had a truck one time. It was a, a triaxle truck, Kenworth. And it wrecked. And it, it, the driver died. They called us and told us our driver had died. And we were headed to the hospital. We began to pray. And we, we were praying earnestly for this driver. And uh, they called back and they said she didn't die. The truck rolled over on her. But it was muddy in the place where it was. And she sunk down in the mud. And it kept that truck off of her. When we got to the hospital... When we got to the hospital, we thought, oh, my Lord, you know, I mean, she's broke up. It's, there's no telling what we're going to see. We should have expected more of a miracle than we did. And we walked in. Her husband's reading a paper. And I said, you know, I'm, I'm just, like, so sympathetic. Where is she? And he said, well, you can go back and see her. And I thought, oh, God, I don't want to. <laughs> and we went back there. And he was a truck driver too. He said, "Well, this is just, this is just the tool of the trade. This is some things. It happens like this." And I thought, "Well, boy, you're really sympathetic with her." <laughs> and we get back there, and the doctor said, "Well, if you hang around, you can take her home." She didn't have a broke bone. <laughs> and I'm telling you that to tell you. I thought, you know what, because we lost so much after that. And I thought, you know what, you're not only going to pay me back the cost of a Kenworth, but I'm going to bring it into the now price. I'm going to tag interest on. You're going to pay me back for the load that that truck was hauling. 
the tires that blew out on that truck, the, the mental anguish that we went through, and I just began to tally that up, and it come to quite the sum. So every time I would see a triaxle go by, I'd say, there's so much money coming to us, so much money coming back to us in the name of Jesus. I, my grandkids started laughing at me, said, listen it, Grammy, she's calling that in. I said, listen, this is your inheritance. They said, there's that much money coming to Grammy. There's that much money coming to Grammy. And so the kids started saying it. They said, say that, say that. That's our inheritance, say that. What are we doing? We're declaring for that harvest, that cry in the harvest to come. So tonight, if you're ready to sow your seed, you need to get it, get it down in your spirit tonight. I'm calling in my harvest. My harvest has cried. It's spent too many nights in that field crying for its original owner. So we make this declaration tonight as you get your seed ready to give. And it's on the screen, the ways to give here, the text to give. Let me put my glasses on. The checks that you can make your checks payable to uh, miracles happen. You can give online. You can give by PayPal. Or you can just give here just in person. Just whatever, how, all these ways. Look at all this stuff. The, this technology is great now. I don't remember the stuff Krista does, and she tells the, the but you look at all these numbers. You, can y'all see those? <laughs> look, text uh, the amount to, is that JHM? Okay. And then the checks, make them payable to Miracles Happen. Visit online, uh, Joan Hunter. Dot org donate and then or you can go to paypal do y'all get all that okay here come okay, okay. Gonna say just to just to make it nice and just to make it nice and simple there's offering envelopes right in front of you, Thank you. and or on the front row here and if you need one raise your hand you can do checks cash credit card on the offering envelope and when you put it in they're going to pass the buckets tonight so when you put it in the bucket what do you say Go and grow. Yes, speak to your seed. Amen. Amen. Well, see, I get carried away preaching. I am a pastor. And so, <laughs> but there is envelopes. She told me that, that you can fill that out. Thank you, Matt. Father God, I want to pray over each and every one's given tonight. As they give, Luke 6, 38 says, Give, and it shall be given unto me. Good measure, pressed down shaken together and running over shall men give unto my bosom for with the same measure that i meet with all it shall be measured to me again do you believe that i believe it and i receive it in jesus name
place yeah. on the stage tonight And he's bidding you to shout and celebrate hey.
looking at me like, I don't know whether they eat out of that pan or not. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what people around is watching. I, I don't know how it's translating either, but. Sometimes you just gotta get down, get with it. Something like this. are good toward us. Lord, we thank you that you are our God and not some stone or rock or tree or some man's idea. Yeah. I give you praise and honor and glory you, for it. For you're the word of the Lord. For the word of the Lord says these things. That there has been a line drawn in the sand now. In the sand, yes. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. A line has drawn in the sand. And now lines have been drawn and redrawn and boundaries defined again. For this time, men never expected what would happen to happen. 
They thought they controlled it all, but it happened. And now, says the Lord, I am going to expand boundaries. And I'm going to give back land to Abraham. I'm going to give them more land. And all nations will rage. And they will scream and cry, but their voice will grow hoarse and melt away. For a jackal can only bark so long. So says the Lord, I'm going to increase your boundaries. And I am going to invite you to step out further than you've ever stepped before. For this is a night to step into your greatness and a night to step into your future. For the future awaits. But don't you wait. Step into it now and just say by faith, I will take it. I will take it. I will enlarge my stakes. I will enlarge my tents. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can't you hear? You can if you listen. If you listen, you can hear.
You know, you, uh, you lend yourself to the Lord for the night and you begin to raise the sounds he wants raised. And it disrupts things around you. And it disrupts the enemy's camp around you. And it creates a frequency for your heart to hear. Did you notice that tonight, that how your heart could hear? You went from a celebration, laughing and jumping, and suddenly you were in a position that the Lord spoke. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Well, you can turn around and tell four or five. Eight, 28, 38 people. How good it is to see them tonight. Hallelujah. Man, it is good to see everybody tonight. I mean. <laughs> Are you excited? Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's lift our hands up and thank our God. He is worthy to be praised, thanked. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for this night. Lord, we ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we can learn your word together as a family. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Before, uh, would you listen to the words, these words the Lord gave me earlier? He said, will men find the courage to fight again when the very will to fight has been systematically beat out of them? The vision of men has been diminished to the point they can only see to the end of the week. God says, said people perish without a vision. Therefore, vision is systematically being taken away from the people. It is being replaced with a false hope that if I don't resist, somehow in some way things will turn around. We live in these times of slavery. Men's lives are being bought and sold every day. Every generation brings us closer to the cage of slavery being in our minds. Once it is there, once it is there, there is no escape because you carry your own cage with you everywhere you go. So f freedom only comes from God, and it only comes from the Word. And all the freedoms given to you in this nation didn't come from government. It came from God. Governments were instituted to protect the freedoms God gave you. No other reason. Now, I want to talk to you just about a few things tonight. Man, it's already been good, hasn't it? Yeah. Hallelujah. You know, the glory is all in here. It's just, wow. You know, I remember years ago, uh, Kat, I was, Robin and I was, um, I might have showed you, you and Bing that building. I don't know, but but we were, <laughs> we were in this building. And, you know, in those days, somebody, a guy that owned a pawn shop there in, in Warrior, back then he said, man, they, the city ought to give y'all every building in here because you remodel every one of them you move into. Because we were constantly trying to go into something, trying to push forward, trying to do better, you know. And people were staying away by the thousands. And so we, you know, we were, <laughs> that's the truth. But we were in this one little storefront building, and it, it, was, it was a very old building, and it really only had one way in. You came in through the, 
through the two, you know, it's the old stores with the big brass bars down the handles that you put. And, and you, you could really only come in through there. It had a little back door, but you didn't want to use it. And so it had three stages. We built three stages in it. We didn't really know what to do when we got saved, so we just built a Christian nightclub. <laughs> That's what we did. And it was for youth, and, you know, we'd bring the youth in, and we'd minister to them. And, and it was uh, miracles that would stagger the mind would take place. You know, I remember people started piling in, all the youth. They, they heard something was happening up there in Warrior. They started coming in. I remember one, one of the first miracles we saw in that place. And, and this just so many of them. But one of them was a youth group came from out of Gardendale, which is right down below us. And they came up there, and the man brought his youth group in, and they just sit there real quiet through the night because it's a wild night. I mean, you know, we, man, we'd play. We had a band on that stage, and then I'd preach on this stage, and we had dramas on that stage. And there was a little aisle between us, between these two. So they're sitting there, and the end of the night came, and she, she started to get up, one of his youth, and she put her shoes on. She had them off, you know. Put her shoes on, and she said, well, and she's tried to put them on again. She said, well, and he said, well, what's wrong, her youth pastor? She said, well, I think I've got the wrong shoes. No, and, and she put her foot in, and she said, oh, my God. He said, what is it? She said, when I came in here, I had spurs on my heels about that long. And now they're gone and my shoes are too big for me. <laughs> and it just, it just started happening. Well, after that, you couldn't keep people away, you know. And things would happen in there that was just amazing. I mean, just stagger your mind, your thinking. And, uh, but, but you're young and ain't got any better sense than believe God. And so, you know, you just do whatever he told you. So one, one day we decided we was going to hold a Bible study there, and it was going to be uh, every Sunday at 2 o'clock. And so, <laughs> so I walked up behind the podium after a Saturday night service with the youth. We didn't get out until 1 or 2. And so I walk up there, and I'm a little bit tired. Never felt so ordinary in all my life, Brother Hagin used to say, you know. And I just, <laughs> just standing there. And... Um, I looked up like this. Robin was over here playing the piano then. I looked up, and something I caught out of the corner of my eye. We say the corner of my eye. Y'all y'all get it. You, you Texans. Right? You get out of the corner of my eye. And it moved, and, and I, I just looked like this. And when I turned to look, this cloud came out of the wall. Just right over the, the bathroom door over there where you went back to the bathroom. It just came right out of the wall. And it wasn't a smoke like I see all in here. It was just a cloud. I mean, it was a boulder-looking cloud like you see in a summer sky. And it just came out of that wall and stopped right there. And I did just like this. Never felt so ordinary in all my life. I did just like this. And I looked at it, and then I looked back at the people. And they're just looking at me. And I look back at the cloud and I looked at the people. And I said, what is happening? And I thought, oh, dear God, this old building's on fire. <laughs> I, said, I said, if the people see that it's burning, they will kill each other trying to get out that front door. It's the only way they could get out. I said, everybody just lift your hands and close your eyes and start praising God. I didn't want them to see that, that smoke. I know there ain't no reason to lie to God. I mean, I, I, I didn't realize I was deceiving. I was trying to protect them. I looked at one of the youth, and I said, go in the back while they had their eyes closed. I said, go in the back and see what's on fire. He came out, and he said, I looked over again, and now it started breaking up and drifting down the wall. I said, oh, dear God, this building's on fire. I said, everybody, let's just lift our hands and close our eyes again. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> I didn't want them to trample each other. I'm telling you the truth. And I looked at that same youth. I said, come here. He said, what? I said, go see what's on fire. This building's on fire. Never dawned on me I couldn't smell anything. <laughs> I said, it's on fire. 
He goes in the back and he come out and this time he was aggravated. And he stopped over there and looked at me and went, there's nothing back here. I'm telling you the truth. If Robin was right here, she'd tell you I'm telling the truth. And so I said, I said, it's on fire. So I looked up then and the smoke had went down that side and went across the back of the room. Now the building only held about a hundred people. So it went across the back and now it had covered the whole back down the side and was moving forward. I said, Lord, inside me, what is going on? He said, I am here. <laughs> Man, my knees turned loose. I mean, I was, I was holding on. I, I don't know why I did this. I jumped from this stage across the little aisle to that stage and laid down on my face. And I said, Lord, what, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? He said, get up. <laughs> this is the truth. He said, get up. Go back to your place. This is mine. <laughs> Man, I jumped up and I jumped back across that aisle. I got back where I was standing. I said, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? And by this time, I'm looking out. All I can see is the front two rows. I can't even see the people anymore. And I'm looking and I said, what do you want me to do? He said, have the people get up. And come over there to this corner of the building. Now, you know, later I'm thinking how obedient they were. Because I can't see them. And I said, let's get up and come over to this side of the room and just lift our hands and praise God. So I could hear the chairs sliding on that old wood floor, that old storefront. I could hear the chairs sliding. And then all of a sudden, the whole floor shook. Everybody fell out under the power. Just boom, hit the ground like that. Now, I, I can't see them except on the front, but everybody's out all over the room. They're out. And so I just sat down on the steps. I had nothing else to do. And Robin kept playing, and she's just looking at me. Well, about 45 minutes or an hour later, it started dissipating in the room. And somebody started getting up, and I could hear them sliding on the floor back there their chairs, and then I, I, I noticed some of the elderly ladies were getting up, and they'd straighten their dresses and do their hair, you know, like this, and they were smiling, and I said, Phew, man, isn't that something, and everybody just smiling at me, and the Lord said, ask them how many saw that cloud, that smoke, it had never dawned on me someone couldn't, else couldn't see that. I said, how many of you saw that cloud and all that smoke in this room? Seven people around the front row raised their hand. So they fell out and didn't know they were supposed to. And the room was full of the glory. I looked at Robin and I said, did you see the cloud? Uh-uh. I said, you didn't see that cloud? She said, no. I said, well, what in the world did I look like? Jumping up over there, laying down, jumping up, jumping back, doing this, doing that. She said, I don't know. I just thought you was doing stuff like that. <laughs> That's a true story. But ever since then, the glory has shown up everywhere we go. Everywhere we've ever been, it'll show up. And you'll never forget it. That was years ago, but I've never forgotten that. I remember on 11, 11, 11, we were having a service and, and the, the room was full. And some of you might have saw this on, on uh, I showed it on Steve uh, Schultz's program one day. And, and I was standing up on the stage and I heard a prophetic word that someone had a disease in their blood or an infection, it was an infection in their blood, and that uh, it was really bad, but the Lord was healing them right then. Well, the service went on that night, and this smoke filled the room. And I mean, it filled the room to the point you couldn't hardly make people out. And so I called a man up on stage. I said, take a picture with your phone of this and see if all this smoke shows up. He took a picture, several of them. At the end of the night... See, all that, that smoke and all is 
You can see it all back over in here. It's like a haze almost. And anyway, he, we were standing back by the door. And people had left. And I had his phone, and I was just doing it like this, looking at the, and it showed up. I said, look at that, look at that. A lady standing over here that was a friend of Robin and mine said, wait a minute, hold it, who is that? Go back. I don't know how she saw it. I went back, and there he was sitting back in the back row, right by this center post, there was Jesus sitting on the back row. And you could see him, Krista yelled out and said, it's the Lord. Well, there's no doubt who it was. When you see the picture, there's nobody else there that looks like that. But what we didn't know was that we went back and looked at earlier pictures of the night, and there was a 12-year-old girl sitting in that seat, and she had MRSA in her leg, and they were going to amputate her leg, and her grandmother had brought her there to the service. And then in the next picture, you could see she was disappearing, and someone else was coming out of her face. And then suddenly he was the only one in the chair. She was completely healed. They never had to amputate her leg. And that young lady got married not too long ago and is a beautiful young woman. Something happens when the glory shows up. Something happens when the glory fills a room. The glory's here tonight. Hallelujah. Now, I want to, um, I just want to kind of flow along right here just a minute. We'll see what God's going to do, if that's all right with all of you. Amen. Amen. Now, um, this is going to sound probably a little different, but in St. John 16 and uh, verse 2, let's put that up there. Oh, do, are we putting scripture up? No. Well, I got, I got a screen right here. We'll put it right here. Imagine that. We're having to look at a Bible. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Isn't it? All right. Now, imagine that. We're looking at a Bible. Now, listen to this. We'll start in verse 1. These things have I spoken unto you, St. John 16, verse 1, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think they doeth God service. Now, I want you to notice that, and I want you to notice something else. As we start going through the Scripture, Matthew 27, Mark 15, Luke 23, uh, St. John uh, chapter 18, uh, 19, you start finding out something. Jesus was betrayed by his own. One of his own body betrayed him. You need to remember that. He was betrayed by one of his own group. The chief priest and the elders delivered him to the government. When they delivered him to the government, the government didn't want anything to do with him. They didn't want anything to do with him. Pilate said, I don't want anything to do with him. You see to him. Pilate's wife even came out and said, don't have anything to do with this just man. But the chief priests and the elders are the ones that delivered him. They delivered him to the government. You got to need to listen to me a minute. They delivered him to the government. The government wanted nothing to do with him. But religion and the religious leaders pressed on Pilate until Pilate said, okay, you take him. You crucify him. So he even washed his hands and said, I don't want anything to do with him. I wash my hands of this man. And so they're looking at him. Then they take, and once they've crucified him and he dies, he gave up the ghost. They went back to Pilate, the chief priest. 
Religion went back to him and said, we want him put in, when, he, when he's put in that tomb, we want soldiers to guard him and an official government seal on that tomb. Pilate did it. The only thing they didn't get their way on was the sign Pilate had written to go above his head. It wasn't an accusation. It was a fact. This is Jesus of Nazareth, king of the Jews. I want you to listen close to what I'm telling you now. Pilate called Jesus into the back. Remember, he said, well, you don't remember it, but you've read it, where, where he's sitting there, and suddenly Pilate looks at them and says, why do you want to kill him for? I'm paraphrasing. They said, because he, being a man, made himself God. He said he's God. He said he's the Son of God. Pilate called him in the back, brought him into the private place, and said, who are you? Who are you? Pilate believed who he was. It scared him. It scared him. But religion kept pressing to kill him. Now what you may not know is you just learned from the scripture the balance of power in the earth. The government is not the highest power in the earth. Religion is the highest power in the earth. It's always religion. It's always the belief of, of the supernatural. It's always religion that rules in this planet. Government only does what it tells them to do. Now, you're not listening to me. Government knows what the power is. They know exactly where the power comes from. They'll never mess with the church unless the church says you can mess with us. It always has to give power over because it's made that the greatest entity in the planet is God's people. Oh, you're not, you're not, I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to get us somewhere. When government goes, okay, how am I going to do that, Lord? When Gideon and his army, he's building this army, his, his 32,000. Okay, here they come. He's got it. He's ready to go. Then the Lord says, you got too many. I want you to ask them, whoever's fearful, go home. So he says, whoever's fearful, go home. 22,000 left. 22,000 went home of God's people. But they needed to be home. They're going to cost someone their lives. Then the next thing, he says, you still have too many. So he takes the rest of them down, the next 10,000, and he says, now tell them to drink at this water. Whoever gets on their knees like a dog and sticks their face in the water, put them to one side. Whoever kneels down and dips up the water in their hand and drinks it, put them by themselves. The 300 that dipped up with their hand, that kept an eye and could see everything around them, they were there on purpose. The others quit looking. Lord, you got to help me here. I, I'm, I'm trying to do something here. The others had quit looking. What is that? The church, the church has become, for the majority, fearful. They're fearful. They think that if they don't resist, don't say anything, don't do anything, not vocal about anything, that somehow this mess will straighten itself out because, after all, God is in control. Really? Really? God's in control whether you like it or not. That, is that what we're saying? Well, he wasn't in control of your life till you gave him control of your life. God's in control where God is put in control. So here, here it is. You have, a, you have this whole big, and I'm going somewhere. Look at your neighbor and say, he's going somewhere. 
So we've got this whole thing going on here. We've got this huge amount of, uh, of power. The power in the earth is God's people. We have this huge, but then we have so many of them, a majority of them has become afraid. So they just go home. The next bunch has their face stuck in the water and has quit looking. They're not watching. They're not alert. Who are they? Well, you see them. You see them all the time. They're the ones coming up in this month that will put demons out on their front yard. They'll create a habitat for devils. They'll place all kinds of goblins and ghouls and, and witches and all kinds of things that celebrate the occult and create an atmosphere for a demonic spirit, and they'll put all that out on their yard. They're the ones with their face stuck in the water. No, everybody's, oh, we loved you, brother, until you started that. Then you talk, you, you think that's all? No, that's not all. You can tell the ones who have their face stuck in the water. Because they started ordaining homosexuals in the pulpit. They started ordaining homosexuals in the pulpit. They, they, they promote LGBTQ. They promote BLM. They promote all these political entities that are set out to destroy righteousness. And they begin to, to promote groups that will destroy and, and mutilate the genitals of a child. And nobody says anything. They'll support groups that will kill babies, enough aborted children, and this nation alone to fill nine Midwestern states. That's the people with their face stuck in the water trying to go to war, claiming they're, bo they're believers, and they may be believers, but their face is stuck in the water. The others are too fearful to talk about it, but there is a remnant. Come on. There is a remnant. There is a remnant that are still watching. There is a remnant that knows where we are. There's a remnant that's here in the war on purpose. You know the 300 was there on purpose because they were following prophetic orders. They were following prophetic orders, orders that couldn't possibly work in the natural. But they were committed. They set out in this war. They set out to fight it, and they set out to win it. And when Gideon said, look, we're not even going to take blades into the war. We're just going to take pitchers and torches. We're going to put fire in our vessels and go let the enemy see it. And the 300 said, yeah, yeah, that's what we're going to do. That's exactly what we're going to do. If the 22,000 had have been there, they'd have just fainted on the spot. <laughs> they'd have just fainted. They'd have said, dear God, how's a, how's a, a, a torch and a pitcher going to win a, a battle and a shofar? Going to blow the trumpet, going to bust the pitcher. But you know what the 300 did? They said, yeah, let's surround them. 180,000 or so, we just surround them. <laughs> so there is a remnant that's on the earth now. Now, I want you to see, first of all, that the church has the authority. But government knows it. If governments did not believe in the spiritual world, then why did they have so many idols around them? Why did they have a God for this, a God for that, a God for that, if they don't believe? See, prophets only come on the scene 
and are spotlighted. And I don't mean they wasn't here. It just means they're spotlighted at certain times. See, when a, let me talk to you about this just a minute. A prophet, and I'm not talking about prof, being prophetic. Everyone that's born again has the potential to prophesy or be prophetic, especially if you're filled with the Spirit, if you're baptized in the Holy Ghost. Well, but I'm not talking about being prophetic. I'm talking about the mantle of a prophet that's different. The mantle of a prophet comes on the scene when kings go rogue. A prophet is an officer of the court of heaven. Now, let me explain that to you. When, let's talk about Nathan and David for a minute. David had did what he did with Bathsheba and had Uriah killed. Remember, he used the enemy sword to kill Uriah. I mean, he went so far as to even hand the man his own death certificate after he proved the man was loyal to a fault. He knew he wouldn't open it. So he sends him back to Joab, and, his, and couldn't you see when Joab opens the seal and looks at it, and it says, put Uriah in the heat of the battle. And when the battle is its hottest, everybody, have everyone back away from him so that he dies. And he looks at Uriah, and Uriah's smiling at him. I brought from the king. And Joab had to just probably smile. Say, thank you. Good job. Go on and join the men. Now, David has done this. King David, man after God's own heart. So he's done this. He's caught up with Bathsheba. Nobody knows about it. Joab. That may be why David never got rid of Joab. So here he is, he, no one knows it. David's moved, moved Bathsheba in. She's pregnant with his child. He tried to get Uriah to go home to her so that she would think, he would think it was his child. But when he didn't, he killed him. So now everything is done, everything's cool, everybody's settled. But then here comes a prophet. And the prophet walks in and says to King David, he said, there's two men in your kingdom. One's very rich and one was just a poor man. One had flocks and herds. One only has one little ewe lamb that he raised as his own child and let, him, let her eat at his table. The rich man had someone come for dinner to stay with him. So, but instead of killing one of his own sheep to feed him, he took the one little ewe lamb that the poor man had and fed his guest. David, furious. Furious. Couldn't you see him? Who is this man? Who is this man? He'll die. He'll have to uh, restore fourfold and then he'll forfeit his life. Who is he? And the prophet said, Thou art the man. Now, that prophet took his life in his own hands because he's in private. One man's already died for this. Because when, a, when an appeal can't go any higher, it can't go any higher than the king, then an appeal to heaven is made. And when an appeal to heaven is made, that's what happened in this nation. When the tyranny of King George got so heavy, no one could go beyond the king. The ministers, the black coat regiment, began to appeal to heaven. That was our first flag, an appeal to heaven. Because when you can't appeal any higher, then you appeal to heaven, and heaven sends an officer of the court on the scene. 
so that in order he can bring the court of Jehovah into the earth and God can try the king in the earth. And David passed his own sentence. That's why David said, I'll die now. But David, you have to remember, he wasn't born again. Nobody was born again until Jesus died and rose from the dead, and he hadn't done that yet. So a man's conscience would let him do a lot of things. But notice David said, it's before you and you alone, Lord, I've sinned. And he called for mercy. And he knew what he had done. And then the prophet said, hear the word of the Lord, the decree from heaven. This is what will happen instead of you dying. The court of heaven had sent an officer so that God may try the king. And David was restored. When kings go rogue and there is no way around it, and there's no one else you can talk to, there's no more appeals, and people feel like they have their head in a bag screaming and no one can hear them, the intercessors begin to pound the door of heaven for help. And suddenly, somebody like Elijah the Tishbite shows up. with no real history and tells Ahab, thus saith the Lord. That's one of the roles of a prophet. And as a prophet, I was sent here tonight. Number one, everything is done on purpose tonight as far as this ministry is concerned. The Lord said, come out and play Destiny. Let them hear destiny, the sound of their destiny. And so we played sounds that we don't play. We're not used to playing like that. And it just noticed how it grew and it filled the room and it just kept growing and it got bigger and it got bigger until it started pulling on the inside of you, pulling at your heart. God is waking up authority. He's waking up the authority in the church, the authority in the church that can bind devils, cast out devils, speak the word, and prophetic things start moving around. He's waking up authority. He's trying to show you that you have a destiny that you don't belong in a cage. And only the prophetic can do that. That's what wakes up destiny in people. That's what makes it visible. That's what makes tomorrow's air breathable. See, God is trying to pull his people into tomorrow. I want, to, I want to tell you something. I want you to really listen to me because, you know, usually I'm, I'm going from Genesis to Revelation. But tonight the Lord has me doing something because he's going to do something at the end of this service. He wants see. You have three facets to your life, past, present, and future. Let me talk to you a minute about the past. If you could step back into your past and you could just walk back in time and look at all your classmates you knew when you were a child, you'd say, man, look, there is, look at there, look at them, look at that one, look at that one. Did you know? that you would be the only one you probably wouldn't recognize. That's the truth. Because everyone you knew then, that's the way you remember them now. But you don't remember you like that. You've seen yourself in progression every day. You wouldn't know you. You'd probably have to ask the Lord, who is that?
But if you could step back and see them, you would say, look, there's so-and-so, there's this one, there's that one, there's Michael, there's Susan, there's this, there's the, whoever it may be. And then there's John, look, there's John. I, man, that was my best friend. And if you ran up to them to hug them, you would pass right through them because they're only holograms, shadows of what was. That's the past. You can't live there. It's not real. How many of you with me? I'm, I'm, am I, is this all right? You with me? The present. I want to show you why you can't live in the present. That sounds strange to people. I'm talking to you as a prophet from a prophetic view. You can't live in the present. Why? It's too fleeting. Watch this. If I say Jesus, now it's in the past. It, it was here in the present for just that long. Jesus, now it's in the past. Do you see that? Anything you, now what we said just a moment ago is a moment ago. We've already moved to another place. One time I was in a service. Oh, Lord, help me here. One time I was in a service, and I was down walking, preaching down there, and was on top of a mountain called Masada. And I was preaching along there, and, sudden, and, and I looked down at the, about where you're sitting, and I looked and said, just a minute. And when I said just a minute, you go back and watch the video, and the video started going, boom, 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 like that. And children in the room just fell asleep, just like that. They just fell asleep. And I'm looking around the room, and I'm looking, and my friend, Another prophet was sitting there, and I looked at him. He looked at me. I'm looking around the room. People are getting tired. I said, Lord, what's happening here? He said, you are this many hours now in the future. See, your body is used to, to staying up and getting tired gradually all day. But if you were just suddenly hurled hours into the future, all the fatigue hit you at once. And those children just went to sleep. Oh, it's not, it's, it, this, this really happened. And so the Lord began to show us some things that were going to happen in the future, and you could see them. And we started dealing with some prophetic things and, pro and started speaking into, we were in the future, talking uh, to things and speaking prophetic utterances, and the whole place was in, uh, got in on it. I mean, this was big. It was strong. The cameras, the irises were going wild because they were moving, trying to catch time. When it was over, I turned right back around and was standing right there again and looked and picked right back up in my Bible where I left off. And children started waking up. Time. See, you can't live in the past. It's not real. It's just images of what was. You can't live in the future. It's too fleeting. So what, I mean the present. So what is the present? The present is a place of decision to decide if you're going to live in the future or the past. So when you get to the present, it's the decision, moment-to-moment -moment decision. God is calling you from the place where there's no sin in your life. There's only one place in your life where sin doesn't exist, and it's in your tomorrow. 
Because tomorrow you haven't gotten to tomorrow yet. So in tomorrow, you're not there to mess that up yet. So God is ahead of you in tomorrow in the place where no sin exists because he walks in the place of no sin and he's calling you into your future constantly. And if you will listen, you can live by every word that comes out of his mouth as you walk in the future. It's hitting you and you're walking into his words as you live day to day. And so so you're living in your tomorrow, breathing the air of your tomorrow, and you're living according to your destiny. You're praising according to your destiny. You're singing according to your destiny. You're doing everything according to your destiny, not according to what you see now, not according to what was when you in your past, but according to where God is and what he sees you to be over there. And you're praising according to that. So your future is the air that God wants you to breathe. A man inhales the future and breathe, exhales destiny. Hallelujah. Adam, Adam. We say Adam in Texas. In Alabama, Adam. But Adam was his name. It means red and rosy, blood shining through his face. It means that he, had, he was filled with such glory that it would shine through him and make his blood glow. If I turned out all the lights in this room and took a flashlight and held it up to the back of my fingers, you would see this red and rosy glow coming through my fingers. That's Adam. And it's still light in there, or it wouldn't shine like that. Paint don't do that. But your blood lights up all at once. It's the proof God visited you. At your baby shower. Oh, come on now. And so inside you, inside you is a witness just in your DNA is a witness of God. See, Satan, he don't, let me tell you something. Even if someone's lost, their birth certificate gives them authority over the devil. If they just knew it. Because he don't have one of those. That's his wildest, fondest dream. He wants to be a man, but he can't be a man. That's what the war in heaven was over, was you, me. Now watch this. So, but that's not where I'm going, but I want you to see this. Now, I want you to look at Genesis chapter 3, my favorite book of the Bible, Genesis. I want you to look at this now. Well, let's see. Let me, let me look right here. Let's look over at, um, yeah, look, look at Genesis 3 and verse 21. Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin. Notice this, coats, the Lord God made coats of skins and clothed them. Now, I want you to notice what it, the way it's worded here. This was after he sinned. He made a covenant with the Lord. He offered the animals in covenant. Because there's only five levels of authority in existence. It's God, man, angels, animals, and the plant life. There's the kingdom of God, kingdom of man, kingdom of angels, uh, the animal kingdom, and the plant kingdom. These are the kingdoms that Satan tempted Jesus with. Didn't say he offered him the nations. He said, I'll give you the kingdoms. Which would have included the nations, but it's the kingdoms. That's why there's a five-fold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. It's the hand of God. So... Now watch this. So Adam, which means blood shining in his face. Okay. How was Adam, 
How was he even created? Well, the word man or human, man would be the word for spirit. He's talking about spirit. Y'all bored, I just need to quit right here. <laughs> so man is the word would be referring to the spirit. Humus means dirt. You know, if you go Walmart or somewhere, you buy some humus. It's dirt. Well, that's what you are is a spirit in dirt. You're a humus man or a human. That's what we are. So we have, we, we're spirits in dirt. So when God created, you'll find out that on, in Genesis chapter 1, and you get down to verse uh, on, on day 3, and you start reading on day 3, around verse 11, somewhere in there, and, and start reading down through there. Well, I, it's, it's not what I need to say somewhere in there. Let's just look. Yeah, and, and verse 11, that's right, chapter 1, verse 11. He says, And the Lord God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding uh, fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. So you'll find out that on that day, God is making everything now that has seed within itself is being planted. Everything that has seed within itself is being planted. And you'll find out that this was, at the end of this day, it was day three, verse 13. The evening and the morning were the third day. On that day, what you may not know is this, everything that had seed within itself, what God did was a mist. I'm going to reconcile Genesis 2 with Genesis 1 because it's a tale of the same, it's the story of the same event, but one is a, from the earth view, the other is, the, uh, is from the, the spirit side, and God is creating Elohim, G-O-D, Elohim. That's God in his full uh, fullness of triune. That's God walking as Father, Word, Holy Ghost, Father, Son, Holy ghost and that's God creating when you see big G little O little D in the King James that's God in his create that's him in his fullness the creator and on day three he caused a mist Genesis 2 6 says a mist came up out of the ground and watered the whole face of the ground in the Hebrew, it talks about these rivers of light that came out of paradise. Underground rivers sparkling with light. With a revelation of God. And a mist would come up. And he's talking about the glory, the glory of God. And when the glory, the mist came up, God did something on day three that no one had, could see. An angel didn't see it. There wasn't any men yet, but no angel could see it. It was a mystery hidden in God. What did he do? He made a cast of himself. He stepped down, and you see, it says he, he formed man of the dust of the ground. And you start really looking at it, and you'll find out it's, he's talking about a cast. What is a cast? Well, I watched a man make a cast. I got curious. Curious mind wants to know. So I start looking it up. I want to see it. So I watched him make a cast of a, someone's arm. Not a cast on the arm, a cast of the arm. They took a five-gallon bucket, filled it up with something. They let it almost dry, and they had a man and, and, and a, a woman or husband and wife take their hands like this. I guess it was husband and wife. Stuck their hands down in that bucket like that, and then they let it almost dry, and then they pulled it out, and all you could see was a little hole in the plaster. Then he took something and poured it in that hole and smoothed it over and let it dry. Then he turned the bucket over and took the bucket off, and there was a shape of a bucket. Then he turned the bucket back over, and there was the little pink hole. He started pulling the debris away. And as the debris started falling away, you could see the veins and the arms. Then you could get down to the hands, and it was a perfect cast of those hands. When God got ready to make the man, there was nothing like the man. God always speaks to what he wants something made out of. If he wants, if he's going to make a plant, he'll speak to the dirt. Out of the dirt comes the plant. Take a plant out of the dirt, throw it down, it'll turn back into dirt. 
He wants fish. He speaks to the dirt under the water. Now under the water comes the, the wet fish, the dirt. Take a fish out of water, throw it on the ground, it'll turn back into wet dirt. That's where it came from. But there was no man. So God was going to do it out of himself. So he, on day three, the spirit of the man was already inside God, was in God, hidden in this secret place, untouchable by anything. And angels knew something was going on inside God. They would fly around his throne, these living creatures, these zoes. They would go around his throne full of eyes within and without. I believe they kept growing eyes to try to look at deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And every time they would go around him, oh, they would draw back when they'd look into his eyes and say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was was and is and is to come and then the next one would come by holy 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 lord god almighty they couldn't get past his holiness because angels can't get down inside god they can only see up to their holiness that's where they were created was in his holiness not in his they wasn't created out of his depth of love they were created out of his holiness even though love is the one that produced them come on now and so there they are. They're looking, searching with these eyes rolling around in them. And one of them caught, caught a hold of something. It changed his face into the face of an ox. And then one, the face of a flying eagle. One, the face of, of a man. And, and, and just a roaring lion. Seeing these four aspects of God. They can't get past it. They can't get, their eyes are searching 24 hours a day, seven days away. They know something's happening inside it, but they can't see it. So they, they develop more eyes to look. They still can't see it. And just to, just to make it shorter tonight, I know. He goes, God, can you imagine when God stood up from his throne? The Bible says his train. His train fills the temple. The smoke of his glory starts filling up a room. And don't you know all those living creatures fall? He steps into that glory that's hovering above on the ground. He steps down into that and disappears from sight. In those days, there would have been six, seven feet of topsoil. He laid down in that wet earth. And he sank down in that earth. David said, in your underground workshop, I was fearfully made. He went down under the ground and cast his image. He cast his own image. And he came back up out of there and filled it with his faith. On day three, everything that had seed within itself. Three days and three nights later is day six. And what God did on day six was step down into that place where he knew where that was. And he began to pull the debris back. And as he uncovered, there lay his cast. And God laid down on top of that man. The Hebrew says he shadowed him. That means he went, he went this way. And laid down and put his eyes on his eyes so he could see what he could see. His mouth on his mouth so he could say what he could say. And he reached out perfectly because it was his own image so he could reach what he could. And he was above him because the only thing above this man was going to be God. And God would be his source forever. And so God took an inhale. <gasps> you can't ever find God doing that. He's always breathing. <sighs> yeah. He's 
breathing out life. He inhaled and caught up that man in his breath. The man's spirit, the man, the real man, was in him. Satan started a war in heaven trying to abort the man. But he was hidden in God. And so he caught up the man's spirit in his breath, stretched himself on the cast, and breathed that spirit, breathed what he created into what he had made, and the man became a living soul. And when God raised him up, it would have probably looked like he's pulling him up out of a six-foot hole or a grave, brought him up out of the grave and stood him before him after three days and three nights. The first Adam, oh, come on now. The first Adam was raised up out of that dust, and he was a prophecy. It was a prophecy from the very beginning beginning that man watch that man one day God would take the form of a man and die and be buried three days and nights and after that he would raise up with power hallelujah and he would raise him up with great power and so the beginning of a man's life was the prophetic And it foreshadowed and foretold and prophesied Jesus would come. So when he breathed that spirit in him, man began to glow with the glory of God. And he looked right in the eyes of the Almighty and he didn't draw back. He knew that was his father. I remember years ago I found studying all of this years ago. And it's one of the, some of the Hebrew words begin to reveal. It said, kneeled like God kneeled. And I said, Lord, you didn't kneel to anyone. He, I could almost hear him laugh. He said, son, I wasn't kneeling to anybody. He said, I was kneeling the way you would to let your child run to you. And Adam would have ran right up to him. Well, there was no death in the earth. None. There was no decay, no rot of any kind. So man would have only needed one layer of skin and the glory. But the moment that glory went out and Adam was afraid, he said, oh, the Lord God came and walking in the garden in the cool of the day, the Ruach, the Spirit. He said, where are you, Adam? What it really is talking about is Adam would go into a prophetic euphoric worship. He would start to worship, and at a certain time of the day, he would worship until it's revealed in the wording that the air, um, no, the life of the day, whatever made the day live would come, would come alive around him, and God would walk up in the life of the day. Whatever made the trees live, the plants live, the oceans live, the, the, the people live, the, whatever, made it, whatever made life as Adam would worship euphorically. Prophetic, it says prophetic worship. In other words, Adam was looking down through the future, worshiping according to his destiny. And when he did, the, the air, the life of the day would come alive and God would just walk up and wrap himself in the life of the day and Adam and him would walk together. After he sinned, I want you to notice something. God comes into the garden, the Lord God. He said, where are you, Adam? He said, I hid myself because I was afraid. That had never been uttered before. 
No fear existed until then. I was afraid. He said, who? He said, because I was naked. He said, who told you? You were naked. You digested a word that I didn't give you. He said, now watch this. When that light went out, he took those fig leaves. Because that's, that's probably the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was the fig tree. That's why he took the leaves. He knew his destiny depended on what he did with that tree. In obedience or disobedience. It was the knowledge of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He didn't create it. It was what he did with it. And so he immediately tried to get back in that tree. So when that light went out, he only has one layer of skin. He was afraid. There's a lot of reasons he was afraid, but that's one of them. And he said, I hid myself. Because he, he knew he would die. So the scripture says here, verse 21, chapter 3, And unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins. The Hebrew says he layered his hide. Now you have multiple layers of skin. Anybody know how many? Three, third degree burns. Three, a gift from the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost to preserve your life. Every so often, one falls off and another replaces it. Coats of skins. Adam made a sacrifice and a covenant to survive. Yes, he did take the animal skins and put coats on. But that's not primarily what that word means. It means layered hide. He's given us an insight to something. Hallelujah. But this is, the, you know, that's not even what I set out to tell you. What I wanted to tell you was, <laughs> was that when he came into the garden, he said this. He said, Adam. Oh, listen now. Adam, where are you? Well, now I want to ask you a question. Do you think that this is when God found out what he had done? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just positive. I'm more than positive. I'm a hundred and two hundred and a thousand percent knowing God already knew he had sinned. So he came to him and he said, where are you? He said, I hid myself. <laughs> I hid myself because I was afraid. Now watch this. He said, who told you you were naked? So, Because I was naked. Who told you that? He said, you know, it was the woman. The woman says, the serpent. The Lord God said, told the serpent the harvest he was getting, told everybody the harvest that was coming. Oh, we don't have time to preach all this, but watch this. He says, and he, st <laughs> he starts talking, he says, where are you? They heard the voice, and let's go back and look at it now, verse 8. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden or conversating really is what it says, in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. The Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? Where art thou? He said he called to him. Where art thou? <laughs> Where are you? It means confess to me. He said, <laughs> said, confess to me. But he didn't. We don't know what would have happened at that point. 
Now, Jesus would have had to still come and die. But things would have got really better right there if Adam had said, look, I blew it. I absolutely blew it. I, I, I conned my wife into eating that fruit. Because we got this picture that she ate the fruit. And she ate it, and that serpent said, eat the fruit. Eat the fruit. We, we got this picture, you know. Eat. And, the, and the woman, what is your name? Serpent. Eat the fruit. So she ate the fruit. He said, oh, this is good. I told you. Get you a plate and take it home to your husband. And we've got this picture that Adam came in at the end of the day, naming all the bugs, naming everything he's doing, <laughs> going around the garden. And he comes in, and he walks in the house. And, and you know, and they wasn't cavemen unless they wanted to live in a cave. I mean, these, are, these, these people clothed themselves in light. They didn't wear rags. They clothed themselves in light. Every animal grows its own clothes. Birds grow its own feathers. Horses grow its own clothes. Cows grow their own clothes. Everything grows its own clothes. Man used to grow its own from the inside out. It's called the glory. Until he sinned, and now we're the only ones that put something on. <laughs> Y'all ever notice that? Oh, we get proud of the rags. We used to be robed in glory. So we got this picture that the serpent gave her the plate. She went home with all this fruit. Adam came in. Oh, I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm fatigued today. I've been, I named everything from rhinos to earthworms. And I've been down at the bottom of the sea. Naming the plankton. And I'm, I'm a little bit, that's why my hair's still wet. And I'm a little bit fatigued. You want to bring me some sweet tea? <laughs> no, I got something better. serpent back in the garden <laughs> I got something better he's listening I'll hear it at any moment now here eat this okay and thunder and rolling everything the serpent says got him that's why we got it pictured but the scripture doesn't say that it said in Genesis 3 that she ate of the fruit and turned to her husband with her he was standing there the whole time, and he's the one knew better. He committed treason. She was deceived. Now, my point being is this. He said, verse 8, And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden of the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God and uh, amongst the trees of the garden. Verse 9, And the Lord God called unto Adam, Adam! Where are you? Confess to me. You, you hadn't caught it yet, have you? He called him Adam. He was a sinner now. But he didn't say, hey, sinner boy. He was still calling him by his covenant name. Why? Because Genesis 3.15, it was revealed to us where he said, The seed of the woman will crush your head, serpent, and this, your seed will bruise her seed's heel, and so forth. He's, God is already in the future at the cross saying, Adam, Adam, come this way, come this way. He's already in his future calling him to the place of no sin and calling him from his place of no sin. So the authority 
on the body is the authority in the earth. The authority in the body of Christ is the authority. All political entities know this. And they won't bother anybody in the body of Christ unless religious hierarchy gives them to them. The salt of the earth is what preserves the earth. And if you and I are the salt of the earth and we quit being the salt of the earth, then what's left? Suddenly, political, rogue, political entities think they have authority over the church. If the church all stood up, all of them, if the born-again body of Christ stood up and said, no, this is the way the nation's going to go, and we're preaching it from our pulpits, we're voting it on our vote, we're doing this, we're doing that, we are going by righteousness, and this right here is what we're going to go by, I'm telling you something, they have no choice but to line up. They have no choice because that's the way the authority is set up. Okay, let me see if I can say it to you this way. I want you to remember something. Jesus is standing before Pilate in private. And Pilate said, are you going to answer me? Because Jesus wouldn't answer him. He said, now watch this. He said, do you not know that I have the power to crucify you or the power or the authority to set you free? Jesus looked at him and said something, and we probably always wondered what he said. He said, you would have no power at all over me if it hadn't been given you from above. We think that's God. He said, so he that handed me over to you has the greater sin. Now, you go back and read that. Yes, Jesus had to come and die. Yes. Yes, it had to happen. Yes. And he gave his life freely. Yes. But it was those chief priests and Pharisees and scribes and elders that handed him over to Pilate. And that's why he said you wouldn't have any power if it hadn't been given you from a higher authority than you. So he that gave me to you has the greater sin than you do. So you have to start looking at this. And if you do, you'll begin to realize your authority. So what, what, is, what, what is it that we do? Well, we begin to stand up in the spirit. Now, I'm not talking about a bunch of grabbing up and marching down the street and trying to destroy brick and mortar buildings. I'm talking about in the spirit, the authority of the church that's been given to the body of Christ to stand up and you are the image and likeness of God. You are God's children. You are his family. Take his mighty word that created it all. Put it in your heart. Speak it out of your mouth. Put it in your heart. Speak it out of your mouth. Put it in your heart. Speak it out of your mouth until you make his enemies his footstool. Yeah. Yeah, so the authority of the church, how many of you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. Hallelujah. 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 Yeah. And so he told him, he said, don't, don't you know I can kill you? He said, you don't have any authority over me at all. It wasn't given to you from above. Well, you can say that's God, yes, because it was his plan. But it was someone higher than Pilate that turned him over. Notice they got anything they told him. Pilate said, I'm not going to do it. Oh, yeah, you are. And he did it. I thought they were the slaves. 
Rome was sure doing anything they told them. It's because it's set up that way. The political realm is fought over because that's the whoever controls it controls the affairs of man, the collective of man. But it's not the highest authority. Prophets have always been involved in the lives of kings. Tell me one prophet that didn't deal with a king. Who? 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 who and when you go, I'm talking about the prophets. You start in on it now and you, you, you start to look at things. Hmm. Well, prophets shouldn't get involved in speaking in the political realm. Really? Well, the scripture says... The scripture says that Elijah showed up, the Tishbite just showed up to Ahab and said, it won't rain till I tell you it'll rain, till I say it rain. So he's dealing with the king. Well, then he looks at Ahab and says, you're, and Jezebel, and tells Jezebel, wolf, wolf dogs, real wolf wolves are going to eat you. Whoa. Whoa, I remember that night on Flashpoint. I'm, I'm traveling, and all of a sudden, here's this pink-haired woman shows up. They put, they put her on the panel. You know, it's the network where prophets and, and word of faith comes together, the sword of the Spirit. And all of a sudden, everybody's talking, well, I think this analytical you know, uh, we're going to analyze this political uh, things like this, and we're going to see what actually took place. And I think we're going to see a, a turnaround and like this. Uh, uh, Kat, what do you say? Get out! <laughs> Boy, she hit that. Boom, she hit that thing. I don't know what she said, but I went. I was in my car listening to the radio. Boom, I hit the back of that seat. I thought, who in the world? Release that kind of power. Because she did. She yelled out. I mean, she did. Every man on that set went. Am I telling the truth? Did I, have, I don't know if she said, get out. I don't know what she said. We'd have to go back and listen to it. I'll tell you. Bang, she hit that thing. I don't know what you hit. But it wasn't, it wasn't soft like that. It went bong. It was glass. It was her glass top. <laughs> I'm s <laughs> I was going to say, man, I'm going to tell you something. It came across. Boom. And, I th I th and it kicked off the boldness of prophets. It did. That's what kicked it off. It started prophets being bolder than they had ever been after that yell. That was a cry in the spirit that went out. Sorry, right there. Now, there were prophets, but that started the boldness of Elijah prophets, those kind of prophets. And so, you know... People look at us different. They don't realize we're speaking of things in the spirit. We're not talking about things in the natural. This kind of thing is not one in a natural battle. It's one in the world of the spirit, and that's where real authority is. But now politicians know it, and they either love prophets because they consult them privately Oh, yeah, you'd be surprised who prophets talk to. But, but you can't, those that do usually never tell it. But then they either love them or hate them. But watch this, they all believe in them. It's only the church that denies the prophet.
It's a truth. It's a truth. So now you understand what Jesus was talking about when he said the day will come. And was it John 16, 2 we read? He said they will drag you up before the synagogues. And there will come a time, he said, they would even kill you and think they do God a service. Who is the they? He's talking about the elders and the chief priest and the elders of the, of the church, of the denominations, of the religion. The, these elders is who he's speaking about. He's not talking about the political killing you. They don't want you. They just soon you hush. I remember one time we had, and I'm going to close right here, I guess. I don't know how long I've been. I don't care. <laughs> I, I really don't. I ain't seen, you know, they, they tell me all the time, they, you, I'd be in some places, and they put up these teleprompters. I never see them. I don't see them. I'm not being rebellious. I really don't see them. And some of them said, yeah, well, I just won't tell you. But I, I don't see them because I don't know how to tell this in 30 minutes. It ain't going to hurt you not to eat for, for an hour or two, dear Lord. Oh, I got to eat after an hour. I don't even know what I'll do if I can't get a bunch of M&Ms and <laughs> bring you big gulp. I'm just picking at you. I'm picking at you. You know I am. Just making you laugh about it. <clears throat> but I'm the one been standing up for two hours. <laughs> Now, <laughs> I love you. I really do. I'm, I really do. I mean, I mean that. I do, man. Y'all are the most precious things. And my partners, oh, my Lord. I pray over my partners every day. I mean, I, I got to thinking about them the other day, and you get, I mean, it just really gets to you sometimes. And, um. God bless you. I love you all, too. Thank you so much. God bless you. What, what was I telling you? I got to close. I said I was going to close with this. No, it was before that. Yeah, they drag you up before the synagogues. and Oh, yeah, I know what it was. I was, Robin and I had this building one time, and, and it was, we had a church in it. <laughs> we had a church in every building in Warrior, I think, just about it. This was a little old bitty place, and it used to be a pawn shop. And we'd always go in them and put a stage in it and set chairs anywhere we could, but it didn't have a bathroom in it. So yeah, somebody said, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right. But Jack's was just right down the street. Jack's Hamburgers was about a block over. And so anyway... I remember this guy, you know, he was, he's an art guy. I don't know where his background was. I think he was Catholic. He, and, and uh, he said, he said, you know, we could, we could just knock a hole in this wall back here and tie, put a bathroom in here and, and plumb it out of this other building over here. I said, well, is that building yours? Well, I rent it. I said, but you don't own it? No, I said, look, man, we ain't bringing, I don't want to bring a curse on us. He said, no, no curse, no curses, no, no. You remember Robin, he said, he said, no, 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 no curses, no curses. People believe. They know. They know that you didn't just come from you. They know that there is a God. And so I, I came tonight to, to play Sounds of destiny. Destiny is not just future. Destiny is your future. Destiny is what God's plan is for you. Destiny is what God's plan is for the body. So we started out with that, and it woke up something in you. Then we, we began to talk, and we, we brought in a celebration where we were celebrating the Lord. 
And then suddenly the breath of God was around us and we began to inhale our tomorrow. And then the Lord taught us about his, your authority in him and how he looks at us. He looks at us different than we look at us. He really believes you can do what he called you to. He really believes that because he just knows the minute you try it, he'll make up for what you don't have. Hallelujah. 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 So tonight, let's stand on our feet all over the house. We, we, let's just... Let's just begin to worship just a moment. We're just about, our part of this anyway is about over. So nobody gave me a time. As a matter of fact, brother told me, he said, he said, just take your time. Do, do what. That's awesome. Where's Roxanne? There, I was, when Robin was playing, I kind of looked around. If you saw me look, there's an anointing. There's several prophets in the room, more than several. And you know the Lord called you to that, but you haven't stepped into that. Tonight's the night to step into your greatness. Who is your greatness? God. He's your greatness. He's the great God. And he's calling you. Can you hear him? Where are you? And he could be calling to you, confess to me, but not sin. Confess what I called you to be to me. I want to tell you this before we play this here. Jesus comes to Peter. And he was at Caesarea Philippi, and he asked Peter, he said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He asked his disciples. They said, Some say you're Jeremiah. Some say you're Elijah, uh, one of the prophets. He said, But who do you say I am? It was Simon Peter. Now, remember, when he first met Simon Peter, he said, You are Simon, but you shall be called a stone. That day, it was Simon Peter that answered. And he said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turned around, watch now, and looked at him and said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. But the first thing he said to him was this, and you are Peter. He said, you're the Christ, and he said, and you're Peter, Petra, Petros, a piece of the Petra. He said, you're the Christ, that's your identity. And Jesus said, when you recognized mine, he gave him his. He gave him his identity. You're waiting to, he's waiting on you to recognize him. And he will recognize you before all of creation of who and what you are. The gifts in you could change the world. The gifts in one of you could change the world. The Lord told Moses, said, I'll start over with you. He said, move out of the way. I'll go up through the middle of them, this rebellious people, and consume them, and I'll start over with you. So there was enough in one man to fulfill the entire destiny of God that he had planned for the earth. What's in you? What's in you? Some of you, God is waiting on you to say to him, yes, Lord, yea, Lord. You called me to be a prophet. That's what I am. I will be that for you. It's all he's waiting on. Some of you called to preach. You just preach and you won't preach. 
you're bootlegging your sermons to everybody around you. You're just bootlegging it to them. Every few minutes, come over here, let me tell you something. Let me tell you what the Lord told me. You want them to preach it. You preach it. Some of you said there's somebody in this room and you know you said it. Now, there's more than one somebody. There's more than two somebodies. And I don't know who Angie is, whether that's you or somebody in your family, but the Lord wanted you to know something. The Lord has his hand on you. And the Lord called a name that only you would know. And you have a loved one that made it to heaven and you didn't think they went. But they did. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, so God is waiting to reveal destinies tonight. Will you, will you confess to him and say, you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. You're the one that gave me this anointing. And let him speak to your heart. You are this, you are this, you are this, you are this. Some of you preachers, some of you pastors, some of you prophets, some of you evangelists, somebody in here was delivered out of a homosexual lifestyle and you're an evangelist and you won't do it. But the Lord says you have a high call on you. And there's a multitude waiting to hear you. Hallelujah. Can you hear? Mm -hmm. Can you hear your destiny? Mm -hmm. Can you hear? Oh, can you hear? Your destiny. Can you hear? Can you hear your destiny? Can you hear your destiny? Oh, can you? thank you for this night I thank you Lord for your your anointing your people Lord God we give you honor praise and glory and thanksgiving I ask you Lord to reveal to your people tonight I will Lord I just don't know how to do that right now he said he would show me in just a moment so come on lift your hands and bless the Lord
God, sing just a little. Just lift your hands and let's begin to bless our God. Now these are those who know your call. You just haven't ever stepped into that yet. Some of you the Lord is going to use to preach from wherever position you are. He's going to use you on your job. He's going to use some of you on a street corner to preach. He's going to do it in school. He'll do it in college. He'll do it wherever you may be. Some of you have been given words to prophesy. But you think, I need a platform to prophesy. No, what you need to do is prophesy. You need to prophesy. The Lord told Nicodemus, he said, do you know where the wind comes from or where it goes? Of course he didn't. What he was telling him was, and he said, and you, you can't, so is everyone born of the Spirit. In other words, you can prophesy in the wind. And the Lord will carry that from one end to the other. Wherever the wind originates, wherever it stops, your voice will go. And all the creation will hear. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Say it. I am here. Say it. I am here.
around you now. You see these that are standing here. Lord God, they are yours. They are your people. They are my family. And Lord God, right now, in the name of Jesus, have me my staff. Lord, they have come, they have come here tonight, Lord, to answer a call that you placed within them, a gift that was placed within them from the day of their conception. They see it and are ready to answer the call. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What else? What else? Who out here, who out here, I'm not trying to put you on a spot, but people knew it anyway, that you were called out of that homosexual lifestyle, and you're born again delivered. Who is that? Here, 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 who else? Here, who else? I'm going to tell you something that the Lord said to me. The reason I was bold enough to say that was because of this. The Lord said this. He said, I've called you into a very special call and a very special time. And this time is going to be a time like no other. I'm going to magnify your voice a hundred times. I'm going to give you a voice louder than you've ever had before. I'm going to make that within you, that drive to be, a, to be an activist, to be activated around. I'm going, to, I'm going to use that, says the Lord, for me. And you're going to be an absolute powerhouse for the Lord. And do not let your past identify you anymore. You identify it and tell the people around you, God has an identity waiting on you. God has an identity waiting on you. The Lord said this to me. The Lord said this to me. He says this. He said, you are the, how do I do that? And during the Jesus revolution in the 70s and late 60s, during the Jesus revolution, we dealt, and the Christians dealt with the drug cultures. It was the psychedelic generation. But the LGBTQ and that kind of communities are our Jesus revolution. That's right. <laughs> culture, drug cultures now. Yeah. And he's saving by the multitudes, bringing them out That's into right. their cause. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we're going to have house full. We're going to have houses full that came out of that world. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, say, here am I. Here am I. Come on. Here am I. whatever your calls may be. I'm going to lead you as a, an obedience to the Lord. But before I do, I want you to know a new Jesus revolution has begun. Yeah. And it's a love train moving yeah. across every land, every culture, every color, every, everywhere. Yeah. Jacob knew something. The Lord taught him something very important. 
He taught him that the speckled and spotted sheep is where the strength is. Remember? So the Lord is calling all the speckled and spotted. Every color. Every place. As we say, red, yellow, black, and white. Green, purple, whatever it may be. We are the speckled and spotted church. That's right. And he's bringing them out of the alcohol cultures, <laughs> drug cultures, homosexual cultures, lesbianism. And it makes no difference. Yeah. What does it make any difference to the power of God? That's right. Drug addicts, heroin addicts, they're all coming. That's right. They're coming, the cowboy hats. <laughs> The purple hair, the nose piercing, the tongue piercing. They're coming. So if you're called and you're answering that tonight, lift up your hand right now all over this house, all over those in the altar here, and say this out loud. Lord Jesus, I am yours. You are mine. And I'm here to answer my call. I will do whatever you tell me to, and I will be wherever you tell me to be, and whatever you tell me to be. Use me, Lord, to reach those around me, to prophesy, to evangelize, to pastor, to teach. I am yours to command. I am in the army of God, and I am yours to command. Now I want you, and when I count to three, I want you to yell out before the Lord and answer your call and tell him what he called you to be. Right now, are you ready? If it's a pastor, I want you to say it. If it's evangelist, say it. If it's a prophet, say it. Teacher, say it. Whatever it may be. Are you ready? One, two, three. Prophesy over the people tonight. Lord, they have set their, their face like flint to follow yeah. you. Lord God, and you are complete. You are the one who completes them. They are complete in Christ. I ask you, Lord God, that you will lock their eyes into their destiny, into their future, that they wake up in the morning smiling, they wake up in the morning, Lord, with no more dread. That they wake up in the morning, Lord, with a mission before them. I have come to follow my God. I have walked into a new realm, a new call. And I am here to follow my God. Lord God, I prophesy over them that they will fulfill destiny. Yes, Lord. Really. Really. Yes. Who is that that's in this room? That you, who is that? You were a witch. Who are, who are you? Who are you? Tell me. Who are you? You might as well say it. He stopped me twice. You were in the occult. You were a witch. No, you are not. You are a prophet. Yeah. Listen, who are you? Are you going to leave the same way you came? Why don't you show the show us a testimony first thing before God? That was me. And I renounce it with all my heart. Who are you? Who are you? Are you going to come? You coming? 
Oh, yes, people say, oh, I don't know if that's true. Yes, it is true, and they know it's true. Come, who are you? <laughs> that was you? Yeah, but you know what? Because you did, I want you to lift your hands up. And just say, Lord Jesus, cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness. Live in my heart. I believe you died for me. And I believe you rose from the dead just for me. From this day on, you are my king. And there is no other. I renounce witchcraft. I renounce darkness. I renounce the occult. I'm covered in the blood. In Jesus' name. Now you spirit of hell, you never touch her life again. Never bother her again. Never come near her family again never again lord this is a prophet call into your service hallelujah <laughs> who is rosemary who is rosemary who knows rosemary who is this who is this who is Rosemary to you? How close a friend? Really? Does she have two children? Only one. Did she have another one? Not that you know of. You know a Rosemary with two children? Really? Come up here. What's your name? Say it again. Nike. Well, that's as cool as it can be, isn't it? Where are you from? Nigeria. You know, I have, I have a really a spiritual daughter, Robin and I do, from Kenya. Yeah. And you know Rosemary. Two children. Yes. What's their children's name? Is it a boy and a girl? Two boys. What's their names? Yeah. Yeah. Where does Rosemary live at? Really? Lift your hands up. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray over Rosemary. Just Ro Nikkei. I had asked Nikkei if one of Rosemary's parents were dead because I heard that. She said, yes, her dad. And her, but her mom's alive, right? And both of her children are living, right? Nikkei, I'm going to ask you something, and this is not about you, but it would probably be about that, okay? About anything around her. Was witchcraft involved anyway around her? Yes. No, I'm not talking about her being in it. I mean, around her, yes. Was she persecuted for that? For being a Christian? Okay, you don't know. Really? Okay, would you come over here and stand right here? So do you see what the Lord's doing? So don't go anywhere, Nikkei. You stay here. So now say that again. You have a friend, Rosemary, who, from Peru. But she has a boy and a girl. And her father-in-law just died. 
and which she was around that. Which crowd? No, that's right. It's not them involved. I said it's around them. Yes. Now, her father-in-law wasn't with her in the mission field, right? No. Really? Okay, what's her name? Rosemary? Um, Rosemary? Let's lift our hands right here. Come on, let's see what the Lord does right here. Now, Lord God, I pray over Rosemary. Lord, in in Nikkei's life here. Lord God, I pray over her right now that her body would be healed, that she would experience a great healing in her body. Lord God, that this sickness would leave Rosemary in the name of Jesus, that she would walk free. I pray, Lord, this, and I pray that the callings of their children would absolutely be recognized. And Lord God, that, yes. Which one of the Rosemary's is sick? Which one of you? Yours? Okay. Here's what you, you tell. Now, I want you to really listen to what I'm gonna tell you. The children need to be told how old are they just around about okay they need to be told that god did not do that and hurt them and they have a blame for god in their minds for something i don't know if it's over the father-in-law of rosemary i don't know but i know you, they need to be told that now you tell her that how could I have known these things and known she had a, two children, boy and a girl? Because there's a great call on their life and they're set to upset a generation. To upset a generation. Hallelujah. Rosemary's a prophet. So all this bears witness, it's all true. Yes, who is Tim? Do you know Tim? I don't know. You think it's her son's name? Yeah. Nikkei. That's right. Because she struggled too hard. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Lift your hands up. Lord God, right now we pray over this Rosemary. Lord God, Nikkei's friend. And we pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that she would, Lord, laugh, have joy. And I ask you to send her a financial miracle into her life a blessing into her life that will raise her above her present distress that will raise her above lord this mentality lord that will remove this sadness from her that joy would reign again hallelujah hallelujah hallelujah
this, Lord? Who is that I just, I just heard that you were raped when you were younger. Who is that? Who is that? It absolutely scars you. It hurts you. You? Come here. Who? Who else? Here? Come up here. Come up here. What is your name? what's happening it's breaking it's breaking it's breaking it's breaking it's breaking come on come on it's breaking right now it's breaking right now it's breaking right now it's breaking it's breaking hallelujah Spirit of hell that is holding them in heart and held their minds down. I command you to go from them now. No more shame, no more guilt, nothing else in the name of Jesus. Be whole, be made whole in Jesus' mighty name. you to drop all baggage right now and just walk forward do you want you want to walk into your future then I want you to just do this with me just take your hands and just drop the baggage just just do it just like you just drop something there it is honey there it is there it is there it is there it is Jesus in your heart how long have you known Jesus all your life we're going to pray for her granddaughter she was this just happened to her she's 10 so what I want you to do when she lifts her hands up I want you to if you don't mind 
you'll lay your hand on her shoulder and pray for her granddaughter. Her name is Bella. She's a little 10 year old. And pray for peace for Bella, would you? I'm going to pray with you. All right, let's do that. Lift your hands up. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now over Bella. Lord God, that Bella would be delivered in every way, every form, that peace would rest in Bella's mind, and that she absolutely, Lord God, that this would just be erased from her memory, that she would just forget this in her life, and that, Lord God, she will walk on into her destiny, and she will just play and laugh, and, Lord God, and have a forgiving spirit the rest of her life. And I give you praise and honor and glory for it in Jesus' mighty name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Tim? Yeah, who is Tim? It's your son. Is your son married? No, he's not married, is he? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah, I, was, I thought he was about 30. Yeah? Where's Tim? Right there. Where's Jolene? Where did she go? Jolene, come back. <laughs> Jolene, if you had any idea how light your face looks now yeah. and your eyes, you can see the light of the Lord shining through your face. You're light. Do you feel lighter than you do? You look at this, you know? I mean, I want you to know something. That things, it won't be long as you pursue God now that you're going to be walking where your head used to be. You're going to come up that much. And so the Lord has something very special for you. Now, don't take no for an answer. Don't let people talk you out of it. Because the Lord's going to take you right on over somewhere. And it's going to be real good. And it'll just look like it's about this big to start with. And then all of a sudden, it's going to be this big. All right? You receive that? Hallelujah. Yeah. Like it's amazing. Look how light you look. That's what, that's what Jesus will do for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Isn't that something? Hallelujah. Your granddaughter. That's something.
If you'll pray that, he's going to change it. Amen. Well, you, she's writing it down for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we pray right now, stretch your hands toward this precious lady. We pray for Marissa right now, Lord, that great peace would come into her mind. The peace of God that passes all understanding, Lord, would rest in her heart and in her mind. And Lord God, I ask you to give Marissa a brand new breath, a brand new start, a brand new, Lord God, in her thinking that her mind would absolutely be clear again and that she would settle in peace. And I give you praise and honor for it. And I command you, Spirit of hell, that's playing on these scars of guilt and these scars of pain, you turn her loose in Jesus' name. Turn her loose in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's been a good night, hasn't it? Absolutely. I'm going to tell you something. Your life will never be the same. You've made a step. That's one step. Make the next one and the next one and the next one. I'm telling you, your life will, you'll be walking where your head is soon. It'll just absolutely, it's going to be different and it's going to be strong. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. Amen. Hallelujah. I just saw shame lifting off of shoulders and all kinds of stuff. And one of our sayings around here, whatever God has called you to do, don't do it alone. Okay? We're here to train you. This is a training apostolic center. God's called me to be an apostle. And we train people, equip people in the area of healing, prophetic, a business, uh, you know, business and ministry, things like that. If you'd like more information, we've got a couple uh, booths out there that you can talk to. I want to thank everybody that's watching online. We'll be live again 10 a.m. in the morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Everybody want to have Robin and Robin and the whole crew back again? Yes. <clears throat> yes, yes, yes. So we'll see you guys in the morning. Right at sharp at 10 o'clock, you can come early, a little earlier than that, and we're going to have an awesome time.